Helen Sersky is a physicist, oceanographer, television presenter, and researcher in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at UCL. Her research focuses on temperature, ocean bubbles, bu bubble acoustics, air-sea gas transfer, and ocean bubble optics. She is here to speak with us today. I'm aware that you're an oceanographer, as well as a television presenter. Um, could you please describe exactly what it is that you do? I am quite hard to put into boxes to do, when it comes to description. So I'm a physicist, first and foremost, that comes before everything. I'm trained as a physicist and what I do in my academic job is physics. The thing I apply that physics to is the ocean. So I study breaking waves and bubbles at the ocean surface and the reason I do that is that it helps the ocean, they help the ocean breathe and we want to understand um, where the gases on planet Earth go, particularly carbon dioxide, a lot of that goes into the ocean, the bubbles seem to help it, we want to understand that process. Um, so that's my research, is that I do, uh, I have projects that look at bubbles in the natural environment. So I've studied at the North Pole and the mm -hmm. North Atlantic, lots of different oceans. Um, and I might have a project coming up on lakes, which is a new thing, and I'm starting to work on an estuary. So it's sort of, it's sort of branching out a bit. And then uh, with, so that is a full-time job, but there are extra things that I do. So I present science documentaries for the BBC and for other people, and I write. And I, the writing is fun because that's where I've got the most freedom in a way. That's where I can really express things the way I want to, because everything else gets squeezed through somebody else's priorities. But when I'm writing, those are the things that I really want to say, whether or not mm -hmm. anyone else wants to listen. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm assuming, as an oceanographer and a physicist, your experience of the ocean will be quite different from ours. Could you tell us what you see and experience beyond what others experience? It is, um, it's a privilege to work at sea. I come from Manchester in the north of England, which means that I didn't know anything about the ocean. You know, what we had, what we have, what we had when I was growing up and what is there now are two seas. We have the North Sea and the Irish Sea, and they are cold, dark and horrid, frankly. Uh, they, are, they do have their redeeming features, but in general, as a small child, there was no desire to go mm -hmm. into either of them. <laughs> so it was a bit of an accident studying the ocean and it was, it's an interesting privilege to have because t by its nature, if you study the ocean, you pretty much have to go to sea, which means mm -hmm. you have to live on ships. So you're not just dealing with the science, with the, what the ocean is doing, but you're dealing with how humans live in a ship. And so the experience comes in two parts. There is... This really surprises me, so I'm a fidget. I run around all the time, I do loads of sport, I'm always moving. And before I first went to sea, I thought I was gonna hate it because I thought I'd be cooped up in this thing, tin can, not <laughs> And And actually, you learn quite a lot about your life doing that because if, as long as the ship is reasonably big, and most research vessels are, there's only three places you ever are. You're at work, you're at dinner, or you're asleep. That's it. <laughs> and all that happens on the ship is that they're all much closer together. So as long as there's enough physical activity, it's actually, I, you're not cooped up. But the thing that is interesting about ships is, is how that community works, that you have to, you have to share. So very, it's, it's very interesting watching people walk into a ship for the first time because space is clearly valuable. There is not very much space. Your space is this and you use your space and you can do whatever you like with your space. You do not put things into or take things out of anyone else's space. And what's interesting is that no one needs telling that rule. People arrive on the ship and they take their normal social things and there's this kind of instinctive constriction that when you push everyone closer together the rules work differently. It's the sort of the same rules but there's all these little differences and so living on a ship is really interesting because you share much more because you've only got so much you have to share everything mm. and your attitude you, Meal times have become really important because that's that's the heartbeat of the ship. Basically, is meal times always on every ship I've ever been on, um, and so there's that lived experience. Like, how do you get on with people in this small, tight knit community and do all these ridiculously hard things? So you have to help each other out, and and that when you have a good team, a team of good people with a clear task and you are working together, that is the best thing in the world. I have been very fortunate that I've been to sea in, um, in many oceans of the world, so in the Pacific, in the North and South Atlantic, in the Southern Ocean, in the, in the Arctic Ocean, and then lots of coastal areas. So I've seen the ocean in lots of different 
states and people tend to look at the ocean and they say and it looks it it changes but it kind of looks the same you know <laughs> and, and it's reinforced by our culture because we only bother looking at the sea when it's doing something difficult right big storm big waves it's causing problems then we look at the ocean but actually the ocean is extremely varied you know i've dived in water that is 32 degrees uh, in Hawaii. I've been wow. on the water uh, and you can just sit and sort of be a fish. You kind of float around and just, you know, be a little fish. Uh, and then I have work, I have had to reach into water, which is minus two, to pull something out in the Arctic Ocean, which is not recommended. And you see the other side of the ocean, and that is as cold as the ocean ever gets because when you're on an ice floe and you reach into the water, um, the water and the ice are keeping each other at, at a fixed temperature, about minus 1.78 <laughs> degrees, depending on the salinity. So that's as cold as the ocean ever gets. And the thing about the ocean that is sort of frustrating after a while you realise is that you only ever see the surface. And even if you scuba dive, you're only really in the top, you know, 30, 40 metres. <laughs> and you're just scooting about on this really superficial bit of this engine underneath. There is this enormous beast down there, which is the ocean circulation and all the things it does and all the life down there and all the nutrients and heat it's shunting around. And you're just kind of scooting about up here. And after a while, it becomes really frustrating. It's not necessarily that particularly pleasant down there, but you're sort of aware that you're on the edge. It's like, it's like maybe going to an art gallery and only ever being allowed to stand in the doorway right you can look in the door of the gallery and you go you sort of see the things and you can see the shape of the gallery and see the outside of the building but you you never go in it mm -hmm. and so there's a very odd relationship with the ocean that you're thrown about by all this the surface is so varied all by itself and it's only a tiny you're only literally you know skating the surface so it's this weird mixed thing that the ocean is so enormous and so varied, and yet we only ever see this thin little bit, and yet there's so much variety in that thin little bit. So it's all those things mixed up together, and you can watch the ocean for hours, and, and we do. That sounds fascinating. One of my chief bees in my bonnet is that thing that we know less about the surface of the ocean than we know about the moon, and it's wrong, and it really annoys me. And, and I'm gonna tell you why, whether you want me to or not. Um, and it's that um, we have mapped the surface of the moon to a higher resolution than we have mapped the entire global ocean. However, there is much more detail in the ocean because of plate tectonics and because mm -hmm. of all the things living on it. And the whole thing's, you've also got a lot of depth. There's so much more to know about the ocean. So if you look at this one very narrow thing, which is the resolution of mapping, yes, we have mapped the moon better than we have mapped our oceans. Also much smaller and easier to see. But if you look at the we know so much about the ocean and the game is, we have, there is so much more to know. We're only just starting to appreciate that. Do you think it's, it also could be that we can reach the moon easier as a whole than, say, the bottom of the ocean? Well, we can see it. I mean, this is where you get to the um, tyranny of the visual. Apollo, you know, 50, 50 years ago now, the Apollo missions, and the, the earlier ones as well, they... The goal was to go to the moon, but what did they do when they got there? They looked back at Earth. And the thing, the reason the moon captured people's attention so much was that you could see it, and then you could see us from the moon. I mean, imagine if there was a big cloud around Earth of some sort, and when you got to the moon, you couldn't see Earth. <laughs> People would be far less interested in going there, right? There's no perspective. So the, what, the, what the moon really did was provide... Um, perspective and so so in the ocean the problem is that we're visual creatures and the ocean operates using sound so energy enters it with light but really if you want to send signals in the ocean you use sound and we don't listen nearly as well as we look if I could invent a thing I would you know a completely unphysical invention that would help humanity I would invent a pair of binoculars that let you look down into the ocean the way you look up into the sky because then you would be able to see currents moving in different directions at different depths and you would see schools of fish meeting and separating and you would see faint fuzzy patches where there's the equivalent of a rainforest which is a phytoplankton bloom um, making an area that changing the color of a patch of ocean and you would see it drifting and swirling and mixing and you would see all the recycling that goes on and you 
you would see all of this, but we can't see it because light does not travel through ocean water. So it is frustrating that the ocean is, is not a visual place. But it's also what makes it interesting because then you have to really think about it. If you can look at something, you go, oh, I've seen that. But in the ocean, you can't just look at it and dismiss it. You actually have to really think about what it is. And that, that is part of the fascination of it. Um, so from what I've read, I realized that you seem to have an interest in bubbles, um, specifically ocean bubbles, bubble acoustics, and ocean bubble optics. Um, why is this and what makes them so special? Bubbles are like, in the world of sound, bubbles are like little Christmas lights. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes them distinctive. That a bubble is not just, a, and I'm talking about gas bubbles underwater here, not soap mm -hmm. bubbles or surface bubbles. But um, a bubble is a combination of the gas inside and the liquid outside. And the thing about water is that it's, a physicist would say it's incompressible. And that means you can put it under a huge weight and it basically doesn't get much smaller. You, even if you go all the way, like deep, deep down into the ocean where you've got 10 kilometers of water, the water's a little bit squashed, right? So it's really hard to compress. But as soon as you put a bubble or a set, set, you know, a plume of bubbles into some water, water becomes squishy. And so if you have a sound wave that goes through, it's squishing all these individual little bubbles and they basically light up on a sonar. So the reason that bubbles are interesting, bubble acoustics is interesting is because by sending in sound, you can pick out different bubble sizes and types, you can look at what the bubbles are doing, and they are interacting with their environment really, really strongly. If you shine light at them, you know, it's quite interesting, it looks a bit fuzzy, depends how big the bubble is, it's very beautiful. Video of big bubbles is very beautiful. But in sound, they, they're giants for their size. They are so efficient at scattering sound. And so sound is the best way to understand the bubble because it tells you how much it's how how much it's being squished by its environment and so whenever so for example if you pour out a glass of water and you hear it go -boo, that noise that's bubbles being formed you are hearing bubbles and you're not just hearing them you're hearing how big they are uh, because that's a, basically a direct piece of information that comes out of the sound the deeper the noise the bigger the bubble and so bubble acoustics is both a really useful tool because I can send sound out into the ocean and listen what comes back and, and I can interpret that and understand the bubbles in a place I could never go. Because in a big storm, you don't want to be down there. You send the sound, that can do the job. Um, but it also provides really specific information about exactly what the bubbles are doing. It's, they're so, the way they scatter sound is so sensitive to their environment. So, so sound is the way into bubble physics, basically. But because we don't listen to bubbles very often, it's hard to remember that. I never knew bubbles had such interesting uses. Well, that's only the start. <laughs> <laughs> I can talk for hours about that, but I won't. <laughs> um, your talk today, I believe, was and is on a similar subject to your series, What's Wrong With Our Planet? Um, that was in 2014, and now it's 2019. Have you noticed any significant changes in the weather within the last five years from a physicist's view? So... It is very difficult for, for an individual to say, I have seen this when it comes to the climate. And partly it's because there's a huge amount of variability. Naturally, even if humans were not doing anything, the weather varies, earth systems shift. You know, there are these enormous cycles that might take two years or seven years or 20 years. And, and so what we see at any one moment in time is a combination of what all those the pushes from all of those different cycles so it's very difficult for a human to say i have seen a weather change however what you can do is look at all the data and look at the big patterns and say i think i've seen part of that pattern it's not reliable evidence in the, unless you're looking at a glacier melting which might have been doing it anyway but what is really powerful about changes to the weather is all the data and it's particularly hard with weather because when we talk about the effects of climate change what we're looking at is not just everything going in one direction everything getting colder or hotter or windier what we're looking about is a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle shifting so maybe you know, we, we, we were right under the, we're a bit south of the jet stream actually here. I was thinking I was in London for a second. In London, we are pretty much right under the path of the jet stream. So the wiggles in the jet stream 
they go right across Britain. Now, if the wiggles get bigger and bendier, we get trapped in cold Arctic air or we get trapped in warmer air, and that depends on the wiggle. But the difference of being on one side of the jet stream to the other is a big difference. But what's really changed is the pattern has changed. So what I'm getting at is that I have definitely seen, um, I have seen places and when I compare them to a picture taken 50 years ago or 100 years ago, I can see that it's different. But for any one person to, see they, to say they have seen the effects of climate change is incorrect, because mm -hmm. what has happened is our civilization can see it. And the data matters more than individual experience. And the reason for that is that you can always find a person who's had the other experience, if you look hard enough, the one in a thousand. And that's why you need data, because you cannot say, because if I say I've seen it, and they say they've seen something else, then we're equal, right? But in reality, we have so much data. You know, I have been on expeditions in the Arctic where there was much, the sea ice was much thinner than had mm -hmm. been measured in the past. And you could see it was m much thinner. Um, so I can say, well, maybe what I saw fits with the, with the sea ice decline we know is happening, or maybe we were just in a patch where the sea ice was thin. So. For an individual to say they have seen the effects of climate change is hard. It is becoming more likely because mm -hmm. now we've gone for long enough. Some of these bigger patterns are human lifetime. Like I remember it used to snow more in England when I was a kid. And I don't think that's just because I was a small kid. And I remembered every time it snowed. So it's a, it's a very difficult question to answer honestly is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, last year you went on an Arctic expedition to the North Pole. Could you tell us a little bit about why you were there and what work you did up there? The Arctic is very understudied and the reason for that is it's hard to get there. So the edges, the coastal regions, there have been icebreakers and, and people have tried quite hard to, to get in and to study. So the coasts may be a little bit better. The problem with the middle is that first of all you've got to go through a lot of sea ice to get there so you need an icebreaker. Second thing is that satellites don't go right over the top because satellite orbits are on an angle so they sort of go round but that leaves a hole in the middle and most satellites leave a hole over the Arctic. Um, so the Arctic is, is not very well understood. Um, the other thing about the Arctic is that in Antarctica for example it may be hard but you can walk across the land and the land stays there. Mm -hmm. But in the Arctic you can't walk across sea ice. You, there, you would think, oh, we go in the summer, it's light for a start, right? But then the sea ice is breaking up and it's constantly moving. And so it's actually very, very difficult to get through and across sea ice. Um, much harder than it is to walk on land, however awful the weather conditions are. So, so the Arctic is very undermeasured. So the first thing, so what we were doing there, it was a, a big collaborative expedition, lots of different countries, lots of different scientists. And the, we had biologists and chemists and ice physicists and ocean physicists and aerosol physicists. Um, and the point of it was to basically bring everyone's expertise and then to become a tiny dot that was just a tracer at the top of the world, just going along with whatever the environment did to it and sitting inside and looking out watching the engine from the inside and the big aim was to understand the cloud cover in the arctic we actually don't know how cloudy it generally is we know that we expect low level cloud uh, but then sometimes it doesn't happen we know that we don't really expect high wind speeds but then we had a couple of storms so we don't know much about the norm so, so the idea was to sit inside it and try and understand the processes and the what's driving it all um, and then my part of it was looking at bubbles from the ocean that were definitely there. They've been seen once before. I saw them. There are definitely bubbles between ice flows in the North Pole. I still haven't worked out why. Not all of my experiments worked. Um, but the aim, my, so I had two aims. First of all, I want to know why they're there. Like, why is the water underneath an ice flow full of bubbles? That's ridiculous. Uh, and secondly, are they contributing to moving stuff, organic matter, from the ocean to the atmosphere? It turns out the, second, the answer to the second one is probably no. But I still don't know what they were doing there. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for your time. You're very welcome. It was very informative.